Welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. In this episode, we deal with episode four in the Netflix documentary, The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann. It's pretty incredible after the brief opening montage of Cadaver Dogs that the PR person gives a voiceover explanation for the episode, summing it up as a backlash. Really? After three months of PR, when the dogs go in and find traces of a dead person, and this is the first evidence of what really happened to Madeline, that's a backlash. Are dogs barking a backlash? The fourth episode in the series, obscurely titled Heaven and Earth, is the best of the first four episodes, which is another way of saying the most damning. A better title would be Backlash, or putting a nice spin on the cadaver evidence. In the blog post um, dealing with the review of the episode, posted on March 19, 2019, I put up a couple of tweets, one of them from Poppy Ann Miller. She says, I watched all episodes, started well, felt it went off at a tangent. I should like to have heard the 48 questions Kate McCann refused to answer, including why she didn't scream out from the apartment instead of leaving the twins alone, knowing the abductor could still be around. And um, at the time... This is March 18th. I responded just saying that episode four is damning. Unfortunately, many, especially in the media, don't understand that when cadaver odor comes into play, there's no more wiggle room for a missing person. A cadaver means someone is dead in an apartment, a cupboard, behind a couch, in the garden, in a car. I suspect the fourth episode, and this was written at the time that I'd watched the fourth episode, so I hadn't watched the other four episodes, um, I suspected that it was the most damning of the entire series, and it was. Um, I said at the time that I hadn't watched the entire series, but I suspect from here the narrative turns and builds back up to Madeline being alive. The McCann's recast as a model of British moral decorum before defaulting to there is always hope. And this turned out to be um, absolutely true. The fourth episode sort of briefly um, deals with really the low point in the McCann's um, roller coaster ride. And then from there on, it, it um, ascends. So. In my review of the episode, I highlighted six useful insights, and then I also highlighted a couple of things that I felt were um, that were sort of left out of the episode. In this episode of um, debunking the um, documentary, but specifically episode four, I'm going to be dealing with the six useful insights, and then in a part two. To this episode, I will deal with the what was left out of it. Okay, so point number one. I like that episode four kicked off straight to the point with no muss, no fuss. It went straight to the dogs and provided a smidgen of extra archive footage of Grimes and the dogs at work um, that I haven't seen previously. I did think it was a little tricksy to show the cadaver dog in the opening clip with no context thus psychologically conflating Eddie's alerts with Keeler's. Number two, I like that they provided an accurate representation of where the dogs alerted inside the apartment, even if it was slightly misleading by leaving out the important alert outside in the garden below the balcony at the back entrance. One thing I want to draw your attention to is the graphic that, that they've used there. Um, you see the beds uh, in Kate and, Kate and Jerry's bedroom. But what is not correct in this graphic representation is those beds were actually moved to the side. So you may notice kind of a dark line um, 
where the wall is, um, sort of where the pillows of the of the two single beds next to each other uh, are, you know, behind it. Um, well, actually, both those beds were moved, as you're looking at the image, to the left. And um, the question is why? Why were those move, beds moved to the left? And the answer is, well, because it was to leave, to make room for cots. And so you wanted to have the cots in that space. Um, and then the question is, why would the cots be in that room? And the answer is, well, because the either the children would have woken up Madeline, who had trouble sleeping, or Madeline would have woken up the children, um, or vice versa, right? So, so that's the one reason. Then you must also ask, why would, if that was the case, why would the cots be moved back into Madeline's room in order to pretend that they were there all along? And this is where you get to quite an interesting scenario. If the cots were in Kate and Jerry's bedroom to begin with, and they were moved to Madeline's bedroom uh, after the incident, then the reason for that would be to make it easier for someone checking on the children to, to sort of just casually glance in and walk away and, and then they've done their job. Whereas if the children were separated, so if you had some children in Kate and Jerry's bedroom and another child in another, you would kind of need um, a more um, specific, um, you know, opening a door, looking inside, and then going to another room and looking inside. And then there's a third aspect to that that you also need, which is because Madeline was a little bit older, you would kind of expect... Um, the person checking on her just to sort of perhaps step into the room or vice versa the, the the younger children you would maybe expect someone to step into the room and just see if they were okay or or what was going on i don't know if that makes sense so in other words when you put all the children together it means you can kind of not check as much because they're all in one room if they're in different rooms you've kind of now got to do a bit more. Now, if you bear in mind the McCann's bedroom, now let's just pretend for a moment that the, the twins were in cots in the McCann's bedroom. Then what you would expect is that it wouldn't just be a case of opening the door, you'd actually have to enter the room. Why? Because the side of the cupboards would sort of obscure your view of the cots. You wouldn't be able to see straight into them. Whereas the um, Madeline's bedroom, you kind of have a situation where once you open the door, you can kind of see the cots. You can't really see Madeline's um, bed, but you can um, maybe argue that you can see it. The other reason that you wouldn't want the cots in Kate and Jerry's bedroom is you wouldn't want to draw attention to Kate and Jerry's bedroom. Um, given that there was a cadaver alert in the cupboard, um, you know, right where the cots may have been left. So that's just a little bit of backstory that, that may be of interest to some people. Um, I have done a really interesting post um, on Crime Rocket dealing with the configuration of cots and beds in the uh, McCann um, in apartment 5A. Um, if you guys want me to, I can sort of deal with that in a separate episode. In a later post, I will explain why an additional alert in Madeline's bed should have been made and would have had the cadaver dogs been brought in immediately, but wasn't. I want to put that sort of idea in your mind and, and ask you whether you know what I'm talking about there when I say... If the cadaver dogs had been brought in immediately, why would they have alerted to Madeline's bed? Do you know the answer to that question? Okay, so it should be noted that some of the media graphics are incorrect and inaccurate, not only in terms of the layout of the apartment, including the McCann's bed and closet configuration, which I've already referred to here, 
but also what constituted the front and back entrance. This is somewhat confusing. So for the record, the front entrance faces the road and car parking lot. And so the front entrance and the front door actually kind of feels like the back entrance of, of the apartment. Just um, a reminder, you know, I have traveled to Pride de Luz. I did go right to the door. I stood in front of the door. I took photos of the door. I started my watch at the at the door, did various things. But it does feel like a rear entrance. It does also feel like an entrance you wouldn't use much if you didn't have a car in the parking lot. So if you wanted to visit the beach or go to the shop or go to the restaurant, you would be, be um, disinclined to use that back entrance. It's taking you away from all of those things, right? The back entrance, th this is when I say the back entrance in terms of the graphic and in terms of how it's generally referred to, um, is actually facing the front of the hotel. Uh, the swimming pool, the tapas restaurant, um, and the balcony. So the back patio entrance is actually kind of the front, um, you know, fr facing towards the sea and all that kind of thing. So even though the back to front is sort of reversed, just bear in mind, just bear that in mind. So I want to just refer to a graphic um, where you see the uh, cadaver alerts and, um, you know, you, you sort of want to compare it to the one used in the documentary. And so what you sort of see is, okay, so the um, alerts behind the sofa are pretty much accurate. Um, in the one... Um, In the Netflix documentary, the, the window where the dog alerts occurred is not very clear. It is depicted, but it's just not that clear. In the, I think it was a magazine article, the window is very clear. Um, it's sort of right there by the, by the couch. But then in that kind of depiction, you don't really see the television in the corner. Not that that's particularly important. Um, in the magazine um, graphic, the sort of layout of the McCann's beds is, is totally wrong and the wardrobe is totally wrong. Um, whereas in the um, Netflix depiction it is better. Um, it's not it's not accurate but it's it's um, mostly accurate. The only thing that's not accurate in the Netflix de uh, depiction, as I say, is that the beds were actually moved slightly away. Um, it's also kind of interesting that they don't really show where personal items of the McCanns were. They don't show where the cuddle cat was left lying, where the, the cameras were left lying, what was left on the beds, for example, in the McCanns rooms, where the shoes were, things like that. That's just completely left out of the, uh, essentially, the crime scene. Um, when I originally wrote about um, the McCanns, I relied very much on this magazine article image, and uh, I was actually kind of misled by it because it refers to a cadaver alert in a flower bed in the backyard. Now, once again, this is missing from the Netflix um, depiction. It's just not there, right? Um, and this is a cadaver alert. It's not a blood dog alert. So if you look at the magazine article, it's showing three cadaver alerts and one blood alert. Okay. So three alerts from Eddie and one alert from Keela. And one of those alerts is sort of in a similar place to um, the alert behind the couch, behind the sofa. So... The alert in the um, backyard, and, and again, this is why um, the front entrance, back entrance is so confusing and misleading, is um, 
if you're thinking of the backyard, then, then you, which yard are you talking about? Are you talking about the back entrance yard, or are you talking about the backyard in by the front door? Which one are you talking about? And so, in any event, in the uh, magazine depiction, I forget from which magazine it came from, but I think it was originally in an overseas publication, then translated. Um, in any event, um, it says that the um, the cadaver alert was in a flower bed um, opposite to, and then it just says this entrance, and that's actually incorrect. The actual cadaver alert wasn't on that side; it was on the other side. It was uh, by the the patio door, um, which is that back entrance okay sliding doors and then it was in the flower bed below the balcony so sort of like di directly below the balcony and that says a lot there are a lot of people that seem to think that madeline it's 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 typical um simplistic true crime uh, reasoning is you, you you sort of see that uh, you see something as what looks like a finish line and then you make that the starting line as well so in other words, you say, okay, so there's um, a cadaver alert by the sofa. Okay, so that's where Madeline died. Um, well, the fact that there's two other alerts means that you can't think as simp simplistically as that. Um, and so the true crime rocket science version isn't that Madeline fell off a couch and died. Um, it is that she was moved to the, that couch, but it, it's actually that... Where she died, she actually fell off the balcony. Uh, when I was in Pride Deluge, I took some photos um, through the, the sort of foliage, um, which I will show you guys in due course. Um, I was interested to look at that balcony. I was interested to sort of see the paving and the garden bed below that balcony as well. I was interested to see just what kind of plant debris you would have at this time of the year, May 3rd. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so I kind of went to look at that as well. Um, I've also done a separate post dealing with the the balcony and the Bougainvillea. So you can look at that. That's also something I can talk about if you guys want me to. Um, but let's, let's sort of move along. Um, an updated diagram from Nine News um, provides additional context for what is the front and back entrance. And uh, if you look at that uh, um, diagram, it's also got the bed configuration wrong in terms of the master bedroom. Um, the cadaver alert, I wouldn't put there either. I would move it more to the corner, um, certainly a little bit more to the corner. Um, But uh, yeah, this is a, a fairly good um, representation, um, and what it says in the graphic is, is it refers to door to back patio, you know, the sliding door to back patio, um, and then it kind of shows a picture. It sort of links that point to a picture. Um, Personally, I don't really like referring it to front and back. I just find it confusing. I, I just prefer saying sliding door and patio and um, wooden door. You know, forget front and back. Just talk about what the doors look like. So um, I think referring to it in terms of front and back is just confusing and unnecessary. So um, and I think it, that also plays into the version where did. did Jerry come in the front entrance or the back entrance or the back entrance or the front entrance, etc., etc. Um, what I, I appreciate with the uh, Nine News um, graphic is, is this one does show the correct um, area where there was a, a cadaver alert. Um, and it's also not totally accurate just in the sense that it's showing it almost like in the air. Um, it should actually be on the ground. Um, 
you might think that that's a silly detail, but when you're dealing with a 12 year old case that's unsolved, um, you, you really want to get a simple detail like where a cadaver alert happened. You want to be just accurate about it. Um, I don't know why they don't refer to the actual images from the police files um, that is showing exactly where this happened. So, you know, I don't know why they don't do that, but um, yeah. Okay, so I've provided on the blog post um, just some pictures just showing the front door. And, and here I'm just trying to just show the two separate entrances. You see, you see a wooden door. Um, which is securely locked and then you also have the, the shutters and I want to talk to you guys about the shutters and my experience of the shutters when I was in Pride de Luge um, uh, eventually I'm not going to talk about it right now but I certainly had um, a very clear experience with the shutters it's something very unique to Portugal and I had to figure it out myself so and, and I, I didn't figure it out to start off with And so I've just provided a couple of different um, viewpoints of the apartment buildings. Um, what's interesting is there's sort of a wall going along the parking lot side, which is, it kind of provides a, almost like a canyon for someone walking on the hotel side. So in other words, the wall provides a little bit of cover for somebody um, you, you're somewhat concealed from um, line of sight by people sort of, you know, not there. On the other hand, if you're walking on the drive where it's quite easy to see inside of it. The other thing is um, if, you, if you're if walking along that side, you can kind of stay under the ceilings in a series of corridors and you're not going to be seen really from above. So if you're trying to leave from that part of the hotel, you can kind of walk for quite a long way um, and not be seen from people either higher up in the same hotel or nearby apartments. Of course, you're also running the risk of someone coming out of the hotel down one of the stairways and, and, and could bump into you. On the other hand, if you're doing the abduction, say, at close to 10 o'clock at night, the chances of that are now less. On the other hand, if you're doing your abduction earlier towards 9 o'clock, your chances of being bumped into by someone are much higher. Okay, and then there's another image, um, and it, it's from across the road. <clears throat> and you can kind of see a slight slope from the, the road going to the parking lot. And that, that was quite interesting. It's just the changes in elevation just from the road to the parking lot, to the door of the hotel, and then the other side of the hotel. And the, this entire hotel is built on quite a steep slope. So the, the top of the hotel and the very bottom where the tennis courts are at a, are at a much lower elevation. And a, a lot of Pride de Luge is like that. A lot of it is um, uh, not straight lines. It is uh, ups and downs, um, curved roads, one ways, and, and all sorts of little alleyways and, and that sort of thing. Okay, and let's go on to point number three. Keeler, the blood dog, is shown giving, giving a silent alert behind the sofa. That footage is fairly rare and thus useful. Usually when one looks at the evidence of the dogs, we see Eddie jumping over the blue sofa. Um, and I provided a clip in the blog post um, barking loudly from behind the sofa as Eddie gives a strong and unambiguous alert. So, you know, I've just uh, dealt with uh, cadaver dogs in the Chris Watts case and in the Patrick Frazee case. And what's frustrating in both those cases is how um, ambiguous and not strong the alerts are. So you, when you watch the dogs in the Chris Watts case, there's there's a fair amount of barking, but it's I'm not sure if the handlers are sort of on drugs or something. I don't know whether the handlers are just just had a horrible day, but um, in the Watts case, you had quite a few dog handlers coming in and just 
to my mind, making a mess. Um, they, they, they don't um, record it very clearly. They don't um, report on it very clearly uh, in the discovery. Um, they don't. They're not very. They're, they're not very sure of what they're talking about. Uh, there's also no confirmation between the one handler and the other. Another aspect that confused me was you now had a trauma dog. I'm still not quite sure what a trauma dog is. Um, I, I know what a blood dog is and a cadaver dog, but so what is a trauma dog? You know, are you are you finding other substances like perspiration and DNA? Or, you know, what what's that all about? Um, it wasn't for me really necessary to go into that just because there weren't any alerts to really speak of. I wouldn't say there were none. I mean, the the the, the dogs in the Watts case did show interest in the um, the vehicle, but it seems like they weren't allowed inside the vehicle, which doesn't really make any sense um, because we know there were there was at least one dead body, probably three in the vehicle. So it just doesn't make any sense that they wouldn't talk about that. Um, or they wouldn't let the dogs inside. Um, and then, yeah, so anyway, so, so in the Chris Watts case, the, the cadaver dog narrative is just really, very poorly executed, unfortunately. Uh, in the Patrick Frazee case, it's better. Um, you have, although it's, I'm not sure if there's footage of it, um, you have a cadaver dog alert, a strong alert um, on the vehicle of um, Kelsey Berith. Um, and then you have a, another alert that just seems a bit iffy on a bale of hay. Um, I think in, in this case, the, the dog alerts when it sort of sits down. But because the bale of hay was sort of um, unstable, you kind of get the feeling that the dog wanted to sit. So I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'm sure that there was um, cadaver traces there. I'm just saying the cadaver alert doesn't isn't very convincing. That's all. But t when you compare that to this, you are seeing a very very unambiguous alert. And not just here. You see quite a few with these dogs. You see them at the at the rental vehicle. You see them in the rented villa, and you see them in this apartment. So. You know, if you had to guess beforehand, if you had to look at the Watts case, look at the Frazee case, and look at this case, and say, you know, pretending you're not, you don't know the outcome, and say, what do you think these dogs are going to find when they go inside? You'd probably say, I don't think they're going to find anything. I don't think there's going to be any response from the dogs. And not only do you have a response from both dogs, you have a very strong uh, response from the cadaver dog three times just in this apartment A area, just there. And and that's not the end of it. You're getting more alerts, you know, elsewhere as well, in the rental vehicle, in the in the villa on clothing, as uh, even on the the um, key fob, you even got in, getting cadaver odor on there. So this is really um, damning, damning, damning evidence. And um, some people scoff at it and simply say, so what, you know, um, the dog's picked up. A... And my re response to that is, when last did you go on holiday and someone died in your hotel room? And what you're really talking about when you make a comment like that is, was someone murdered in a room that you stayed in when you're on holiday? Did, did an old person die and they, they lay there for several days? But when last did you go on holiday and later on you heard that cad cadaver dogs went into your hotel room and found that there's a dead person in your hotel? Has it ever happened to you? Has it ever happened to anyone that you know? And then you add to that and you say, okay, so you went on holiday. You also rented a car. When last did you rent a car where there was a human cadaver in the car that you rented? And it turned out that a dog went to search the car you rented. And they found the dogs barked and were excited about 
um, you know, what looked like signs of foul play? When, when else did that happen to you? So now we've got a cadaver in an apartment you used, in a car you used, and then it gets even worse. Now you rent a place somewhere else, and then there's also an alert there. And of course you can then say, oh, no, 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 let's, let's scoff at the dogs. The dogs don't know what they are barking about. So what are they barking about? For me, the interesting part isn't so much the what the dogs are alerting to, although that's really impressive anyway. You know, the fact that this this check happened kind of at the end of August. So bear in mind the crime, the 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 Madeline's um, the incident happened on May third. So it's the whole of May, June, and July, and a lot of August. So it's almost four months that these traces survived multiple cleaning just of you know uh, other people i guess staying there and um you know um even just the whole summer you know the the, the apartment getting very warm and and being ventilated and yet this this um these traces remained and they remained strong enough for the dogs to pick it up in the patrick Frazee case the remains remained for just over a month but a lot of bleach was used and why wouldn't bleach be used by hotel staff in a hotel room um, you know we know the rental vehicle was also ventilated in the case of the McCann's probably cleaned as well and, and then you would say well why didn't this destroy traces I think there's an answer to that but I'm not going to deal with it here but it certainly worked in the Patrick Frazee case. Um, the dogs didn't really alert to anything at the crime scene, which was a bloodbath um, in the lounge. But but there's a there's another kind of explanation for that. Is Kelsey Barrett was beaten to death, and she was immediately kind of um, removed from the scene. So it wasn't like she lay there for hours and hours and hours. She was. She was bludgeoned to death and then she was taken away. Her body was removed. So the blood remained, right? The blood remained behind and then that was cleaned up. But that's totally different from a, a body remaining for kind of a length of time. And that's kind of um, cadaverine and putrescine are very difficult um, odors to get rid of once they are there. And so, in terms of debunking the Netflix series, I think this is where you get a sense of just how sneaky and how sly um, the people um, who are making this series and what they're trying to, the message that they're trying to sneakily and slyly put in like the back door is um, they concentrate more on the blood dog alerting. So, as I've said earlier, the cadaver dog, just at apartment 5A, alerts three times. And so, what they do is they, they just look at the blood dog, which alerts basically once, and not that, not with, with, with as much certainty. It's not as um, clear a, a alert. It's not as strong as an a, a alert as the cadaver dog. And so you kind of take the, the other dog and you say, oh, look, he's, he's not quite sure what's going on. It's not a um, it's not a strong alert. So, oh, maybe that means Madeline's still alive. And it's not um, directly saying that. It's just kind of implying that a little bit. And um, it's so bogus because a cadaver alert just doesn't, allow that interpretation a, a, a cadaver dog alerting is saying some people someone has died someone is dead and so 12 years later saying oh maybe she's still alive there's always hope it's just stupidity so in any way how they do this is they concentrate on the blood dog and then they say okay maybe the signal wasn't so strong madeline must still be alive that's the the psychological bullshit going on
Um, of all the dog alerts in and outside the apartment, as I say, there were more cadaver dog alerts than blood alerts. And yet the docuseries chose to focus on the single blood alert behind the sofa. Interestingly, although the dogs went in on July 31st, um, three months after the incident, it was only reported in the media on August the 15th, 20, 2007. Uh, at the time, an updated picture of Kate McCann was published, sitting on the rocky shoreline on the western side of Praia de Luz, on the side of the beach opposite to the monolithic Roja Negra. Thanks to the archive protocols of Getty Images, we know for a fact that this image was taken on the same day the press revealed the cadaver dog evidence. That's August 15th, 2007. Even so, Kate McCann can be seen smiling in photos and greeting well wishes. Both her and her husband are dressed in matching white and khaki, and as usual, Kate is carrying her daughter's pink cuddle cat toy. Number four. In point number one, I mentioned the tricksy editing of showing Eddie barking with no context and then explaining what Keeler was doing. It's interesting how Robin Swan, the co-author of Looking for Madeline, and there's a 2019 update to her book now, um, is pertinently quoted saying, Keeler was not particularly interested too. I just think it's kind of mischievous saying this, saying that... Um, Keeler wasn't interested either. This falsely implies that the blood dog, just like the cadaver dog, was not interested or didn't alert. But the blood dog is trained to only alert to human blood traces and the cadaver dog to human cadaver traces. If anything, it's a credit to the incredible sensitivity of these animals that one dog alerted to one set of distinctive traces while the other did not. It should also be remembered that the apartment was, was visited, as I've said earlier, after three months of summer when the potential for the evaporation and dispersion of liquids and odors were at a maximum. Then when the narrative flips over to the traces in the vehicle, the cadaver dog becomes the focus while the PR person ridicules the idea that the car was only hired several weeks after the incident, so how could a dead body magically appear in the vehicle? This is ridiculous and ludicrous, is the inference. Of course, the blood evidence inside the vehicle found by Keeler ought to be the focus of the dogs now, but instead the focus goes to the cadaver dog. Very clever, isn't it? Interestingly, no mention is made of cadaver traces also found on the key of the Renault Scenic. And then I provided a screen grab from Joanna Moray's blog. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, and you can just go and have a look at that. And then there's also a um, discussion in an article by the Evening Standard. It's quite a long article. Um, I'm not going to deal with that here. I will deal with it in the next episode. But what is apparent from the article just is how the it shows the extent of the British press were drinking the Kool-Aid and making it for mass consumption. So when the British press were confronted with these um, game-changing, groundbreaking breakthrough alerts from the dogs, they were kind of like shrugging their shoulders. They were kind of saying, well, um, well, the, the, the Portuguese are really going overboard. The Portuguese are really being outrageous. Um, it just shows um, kind of a dishonesty, I think, um, and a lack of integrity um, and a, a sort of mercenary nature to the British tabloids that, you know, we're going to um, present a particular narrative that's going to suit our bottom line. We're not going to, um, we're not going to be intelligent about it. We're going to be strategic about it. We're going to keep the McCanns on our side. We're going to keep this cash cow paying cash, right? Um, another thing that was really interesting in the Netflix documentary, and as much as I dis dislike the documentary, as much as I found it um, um, dishonest, to be honest, um, you know, just aspects weren't 
being honestly reported on, um, whether you want to say it's purposefully dishonest or people making mistakes or that they were misled, um, it just wasn't a completely truthful account, uh, in my opinion. But some of the things that I thought were very useful were they unearthed headlines that some of them I'd never seen before. And some of them were really, really damning that, that I didn't expect to see in the British media, such as this one from the Irish Mail. I saw Maddie's dad carrying a sleeping child and blood in Maddie f flat and confess and you're out in a year and there's a picture of Kate McCann and blood on the wall in Maddie's bedroom and Maddie blood found in flat and so on and so on. And so it's not as though the British media never um, crossed that line, but they did seldom cross it, that's for sure. And then um, you have the documentary just referring to this moment where the McCanns were kind of made suspects and where suspicion turned towards them. And now suddenly they very alienated and isolated. And it's, so, it's very sad just how lonely they are. It's just so crazy how schizophrenic this is because, you know, one moment they are in Rome shaking hands with the Pope, then they had press conferences surrounded by people, then they're walking through throngs of people. Um, it's almost like Jesus entering Jerusalem with the palm fronds, that kind of thing. They're just like surrounded by thousands of people. And then as soon as there's suspicion, suddenly they're isolated and alone and they don't understand. Um, it's just uh, such a sentimental way of reporting on this. Um, it's, I don't know, it's laughable. Okay, and so that brings us to the last point, number six. Um, the media footage of the McCanns driving the Renault Scenic, entering and exiting the villa and fleeing to Faro Airport as soon as the media tide turned. Uh, is also very useful. Um, I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't seen the sort of footage of um, basically the, the, the McCanns were made suspects and then almost the next day they left Portugal. But you actually had some footage showing this almost in a seamless way, showing them getting in the car, leaving the driveway and sort of driving to the airport. And I've driven that, that road. I've driven from the airport to Pride de Luge and I've driven back. So I, I know that highway. I know how to get from the highway to, um, you know, um, the McCann's um, villa and also to their apartment and also just into Pride de Luge. So it was just interesting seeing it um, sort of documented. Um, in one clip, we see an army of waiting press and each time the McCann's appear, it's an opportunity for them to manipulate or influence their the image and, and, and what you see is you see them holding hands they're always holding hands um, if they're not holding hands they're attending church and this is something that Amaral kind of comments on he says they were always very concerned with their image and that was something that shocks me and I think it shocked a lot of people but I think the most shocking thing is that there are, are some people that it doesn't shock at all. Okay, so we're about 45 minutes into this episode. I'm going to end it off there. Um, we'll do part two probably tomorrow or over the weekend. Um, for those interested in um, my books, um, I'm putting up a audio book of Christmas Star on Patreon. Under the $5 tier, um, Chapter 4 is already available. So you can go and check check it out on Patreon. There's also some additional analysis of the John Bonet Ramsey case on Patreon. Thank you for listening.